you're very welcome to our latest As I Am community support webinar. Throughout World Autism Month, we've tried to build on the work that we do all year and exploring different topics that are of importance to the autism community. As an organization, one of the things we're particularly very conscious of is the need for us to reach out into other minority groups who also have representatives who are part of both our community and other minority group communities here in Ireland. Um, it's very clear to us as an organization as we grow that it's really important we are proactive and do more to reach autistic people who are members of communities that maybe don't readily engage with the work that we do or who maybe face additional or unique challenges uh, being both autistic and being part of other movements and communities. The purpose of this webinar is to explore that a little bit further. Um, as I am in our day-to-day -day work, explores what it means to be autistic in Ireland. We want to explore what it means to be autistic and also, I guess, that whole piece of intersectionality where autistic people have other experiences, other forms of diversity, are members of other minority groups, and what that means, what are the strengths, what are the opportunities, and what are the challenges. We see today as just a start of a conversation. While we have people here today from a wide variety of backgrounds, we're very clear that we by no means have every grouping represented, but I hope that on the back of today's uh, work and the work we've been doing in recent months, that we'll be able to, uh, throughout our work in the year ahead, grow participation from across the autism community, representing the diversity of both the autism spectrum and of broader society as well. Um, what I should say at this stage is I'm delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel here today. I'm um, joined by Gavin McGranahan, As I Am Policy Officer, uh, Leahim Brennan, Chair of the DCU Neurodivergent Society, and Rosemary Mon from the Irish Traveller Movement, uh, who's been doing fantastic work with us in recent months and engaging with the traveller community, something that we're particularly excited about uh, in the period ahead. Well, I'm going to invite each speaker uh, to share a little bit about their own experiences for, for a number of minutes, and then a little bit later on in the webinar, I might just put some common questions to everybody. Um, but just to begin with, I'm delighted to introduce Leahine Brennan. Uh, Leahine is incredibly generous to come here today because they're very busy studying for exams at the moment, so it's an extremely generous thing to do, and we appreciate that. Um, the DCU Neurodivergent Society has done wonderful work in highlighting the barriers autistic people and people with other forms of neurodiversity can experience in Irish society, but also the strengths and diversity and vibrancy of the neurodiversity community. The Europe's first uh, university neurodivergent society, so a huge achievement. And I know Leahine has lots personally and no doubt through their advocacy work to share today. So I'm delighted to introduce Leahine. Hi, <laughs> I'm Leahine. I am the founder and chairperson of DCU's Neurodivergent Society. I am a trans guy, I'm bi, and I have seven different neurodivergences which come across three broad categories of neurodivergences. So I have two learning difficulties, I have two mental illnesses, and I have two kind of other things, which are autism and migraines. And finally, I have an acquired one, which is still being investigated what exactly it is. So there's a lot going on with the neurodivergent stuff. Um, and I suppose, Talking today, we want to talk about multiply marginalised people, people who not only have the majority of people listening to this would have autism, so they don't just experience ableism, but they might also experience other forms of oppression, things like sexism, racism, um, homophobia, um, that sort of thing. So one thing which really strikes me is when I was talking as part of the uh, neurodivergent week last month to a series of different women and non-binary people about their experiences of being um, for example LGBTQI plus and neurodivergent being black and neurodivergent or being um, women and having autism is that they pointed out very astutely that if we look at all of the human rights movements there's kind of a timeline and we can see that feminism is quite far along that timeline where there's been multiple waves of feminism and the first wave of feminism was quite awful to be honest because they said things like um you know why should women not be able to vote white women when black men can vote and things like that so very problematic origins 
but we still can see that there's been a development over time to include more multiply uh, marginalized people within that movement. And then civil rights came after feminism, and we can see now that it hasn't gone as far as it needs to in terms of we aren't living in an equal society whereby racism isn't an issue. But we're beginning to see that movement gather traction again. Um, it's in unfortunate circumstances that it's due to police brutality that it's become the center stage again. But with all of these different movements, um, so the feminist movement, the civil rights movement, and also the um, LGBTQIA+, which I'm going to refer to as queer from now on, um, I'll just do a bit of an aside about the word queer. So um, queer is, was used as an insult as in, a, in, a, in a derogatory and kind of depression way. Depression? De Deper, anyway, doesn't matter. It's used in a derogatory way. And older generations, some notable examples being, say, Leo Vradford, don't like to use the word queer. And that's completely understandable, and I accept that. But younger generations of people who are LGBTQIA+, um, have kind of taken the label back and used it for themselves. So I'd be one of those people. So what I'd suggest is it's kind of like the person first versus identity first language. You just ask the person, are you comfortable with me using the word queer to describe you specifically? And if they say yes, great. If they say no, then they are lesbian or gay or whatever their label is, or just LGBTQIA+, even though it's a mouthful. <laughs> it's it's necessary to do what you can to enable people to take ownership of their own, their own identities, really. And um, it's something that is always changing because language itself is always changing. So it's important that when you use a label, you understand the weight behind it. And really, you can only understand the weight behind it by understanding the person who you're, um, who you're engaging with. So that's a bit of a tangent on language. But I suppose the main thing that I wanted to say about, you know, intersectionality and about multiply marginalized people is that from my perspective, at least, there's always been a connection between all the different human rights movements. Because at the end of the day, they're all trying to further, to further the abilities and the opportunities and the equity of people. And all kind of forms of oppression are kind of linked in that all of the movements have faced significant backlash, the, neurodiverse, the neurodivergent movement the queer movement, the civil rights movement, feminism, they've all, even religious movements actually, which I haven't really considered as much, they've all had a shared experience. And I think one thing which really made this clear to me was when the Yes Equality campaign happened in 2015, we saw a lot of the same people championing the, um, together for yes campaign. And what that really said to me was that we can learn from each other, that if, if we only have our own knowledge of our own oppressions, we're, we're naturally going to isolate ourselves and make, make ourselves have more work because we haven't learned the lessons that other people have through being in the fight longer. So yeah, um, I, I think it's really important that all human rights movements acknowledge that when you're fighting for queer rights, you're also fighting for women's rights. And when you're fighting for women's rights, some of those women are neurodivergent. And if you're fighting for neurodivergent rights, 
some of neurodivergent people are ethnic and racial minorities and you're fighting for ethnic and racial minority rights, then you're, you can't divorce that from, again, fighting for women because there are women who are. And I think, I think the main thing that I want to impress upon this thing is that if you're multiply marginalized, sometimes you feel like you almost have to weigh one oppression against another. Like, am I more queer or am I more neurodivergent? And the fact is, in my case, I'm both. And they're both important to me. So I choose to be active in both spaces. But equally, like, I'm white, as you can see, and I'm also settled. So I don't face any kind of racism in my daily life or ever, really. Um, but I still try to be involved with the United Against Racism, and I still acknowledge that my neurodivergent society needs a bit of work on it in order to be fully representative because at the moment all of our committee is white which is unfortunate but i think you can only start to address that problem when you acknowledge it and also when you acknowledge that it doesn't need to be that way like just because you are primarily focused on neurodivergent rights doesn't mean you can divorce yourself from the reality that in representing neurodivergent people you're representing people like me and people who have multiply marginalized backgrounds. Um, that is my 15 minutes so I think I'll just summarize and say that we have a long way to go but if we look at movement towards neurodiversity being a commonly accepted thing, we can almost look back farther than neurodiversity or neurodivergent even being a word, because that kind of ethos of accepting and embracing people for who they are far precedes the movement towards um, disability rights in general. It goes all the way back to when Women started, um, women started revolting and when riots started over um, racism as well. So there's no sense in kind of making a divide there where we can all benefit from the experience of each other and to make a unifying movement that would help all of us. So yeah. Intersectionality is good. Thank you so much for that. I think it's given a really great overview, I think, of the different issues that are actually at play here. And I think that's really important. Um, from my point of view, one of the things that certainly running an advocacy organization and being involved in advocacy, I'm often trying to think back to previous movements and what can we learn. Um, but also trying to, I suppose, when you're when you're talking to people experiencing huge oppression within the autism community today. One of the things I also try and remind people is that if you like, our movement is a very young movement. And as a result, that there is a long road ahead of us to get to where we need to. I think we can lose sight of that sometimes when we're living in an age where other causes have come that bit further, but, but, but we're maybe still only getting, um, getting started. So thank you for that. I think there's a, a huge amount of food for thought um, in it. And congratulations on all the work that you, uh, that you do. Um, I think a, another community of people that is, massively underrepresented in the work that we do and within our autism community at present is the Irish traveller community um, who, who too often um, aren't seen or heard within the autism community and equally maybe autistic people aren't seen and heard within the traveller community and that's something we've been doing a lot of work on in recent times so I'd like to invite Rosemary maybe to just uh, introduce herself and talk a little bit about her experiences as someone who's part of both communities and who um, who who has been doing a lot of work around how we can improve and do more together. Thanks Adam and I suppose just to thank you for inviting me here I feel so privileged I suppose to be the only neurotypical person on the panel and um, so I'm here as a traveler mother to an autistic child and I suppose it's through him 
really that my eyes were open to the artistic struggle and what it means to be artistic uh, you know the lack of services like the fight that you have for human rights just like travelers in in our own country um and it also i suppose opened my eyes to the fact that the traveler artistic voice was missing within the traveler movement the traveler community and the artistic community and the artistic movement and i suppose being an activist um you know i just felt obligated to try to do something about that to raise the profile you know that yes travelers are artistic too we always have been um, and their voice needs to be included in both our communities and leading it and educating travelers in particular what it's like to be a traveler and autistic like what's it like to live on the side of the road and be autistic and be overloaded by your environment um, and not maybe that your parents don't know that they never knew that you were autistic um, and maybe an adult now going through living through that experience and not realizing that they're actually autistic because we do hear that a lot of adults um you know do get their diagnosis or find out that they're autistic at a later stage in their life um, and i suppose for travelers we've just started having the conversation about being traveler and autistic and i suppose that has come from a lot of the work that i've been doing since my little boy was diagnosed um I've been doing a lot of work like an, on, on my own time and it's been a lot online trying to create awareness about being autistic linking travelers into autistic led spaces because thankfully like we, we're truly blessed that a lot of autistic activists give up all their expertise um online as well which is really accessible for some parents so try to link them in there and um, trying to link them in with yourselves as i am and other like local organizations that work uh, within the autism community um, and I suppose like it was a life changer for me because I'm learning every day from the autistic adults that I have met um, and learning through my little boy. Um, but what really, what, what's really special is that traveler parents are coming forward saying my child is autistic or, you know, my grandson or my granddaughter, or my niece, you know, so we're finally starting to talk about it. Um, and little by little becoming more visible um you know that there are autistic members within our community and we need to educate ourselves about what it's like to be autistic so they are equal uh, members of our community and i suppose what was interesting for me as well is that when i started learning about all the autistic statistics they're so similar to traveler or to, uh, traveler statistics you know in terms of employment like i think it's 85 percent of the autistic community are unemployed 80 percent of our community are unemployed um you know, like our suicide rates for, for traveler men are seven times higher for traveler women they're six times higher and i think it's close to 10 times higher for yourselves so if you're looking at a traveler who's autistic you're putting both of those stats together and that's like 17 times higher for a traveler who's autistic them to die by suicide so like those stats have been a great motivate great motivation for me as well because like in the travel community we've seen the devastation of our suicide crisis and how many of those were actually autistic travelers we don't know mm -hmm. because maybe they didn't know they were autistic so i suppose it's great having you know visibility even though i'm a, just a traveler parent that i'm not autistic myself but autistic travelers will be watching this and they will see that they're welcome in the traveler movement and they're welcome within the autistic movement. So all, I suppose, the work that we're doing together um, will lead to travelers who are autistic coming forward, taking ownership of their rightful space um, and building on that love and solidarity between us um, because we are stronger together and there needs to be unfortunately like with the needs to be recognition as well that regardless of what community travelers are part of and try to enter that we do experience racism and within that so that needs to be called out it's the same for travelers who are lgbt um who plus that when they try to enter that community it's because you're a traveler um, and they experience discrimination on their ethnicity but then internally in our own community it's their sexuality that they experience discrimination and homophobia from so it's that you know dual identity and the double struggle the multiple levels of discrimination 
So I think it's so important that travelers who are autistic see that they're accepted and that we are trying to reach out to them and that we do endeavor to work really, really hard together. And I know I can see the passion for as I am and the passion for myself um, coming together and creating change and bringing travelers who are autistic right to the center stage and the next time you know that we hopefully we'll be having a webinar that it wouldn't be me you'd be here and it would be an actual traveler who's autistic um, and i suppose as well just thank you as well um in terms of as i am for funding this the celebrate badge which is the autist celebrate autistic travelers you probably can't see it there but um it was designed by a traveler who's autistic and myself and was funded by by yourself as an organization so again that will create more visibility internally within the community that travelers are, are travelers are autistic, they're loved, they're accepted, and it's not them who need to change, it's us as a community who need to change, change our environment to make sure that they are equal players um, within both our communities, but also within the wider um, wider communities and the wider society in general. So that's me for now. Thank you so much, uh, Rosemary. And there's there's so much I could take apart there, and probably will when we get to the um to the, to the to the questions. I think just that whole idea of kind of mutual oppression, I think, is really really interesting. Uh, that you know people can face barriers within both of the communities for being a member of the other community, um, and also I guess how, what we can do to educate both communities to be more accepting. I think there's a lot of work to be done there, and it's a uh, it's both both challenging, but also I think exciting and, and great to see that journey uh, begin. Um, next up, I'm delighted to introduce Gavin. Um, Gavin would be no stranger to, to people within As I Am as our long suffering policy officer. Um, and also somebody who's done a lot over particularly the last year um, and something close to my heart as well in terms of increasing the outreach of As I Am into the LGBT community uh, through organizations such as Shout Out, for example, through upskilling our staff. And I'm happy to hand over to Gavin now to hear a little bit more. Thanks so much as well for inviting me to speak uh, on this panel with uh, other great panelists. It's been really interesting to hear Rosemary and Leifine's perspectives from their own communities. And they've both hit on really great points about, you know, intersectionality, mutual barriers that each faces, the consequences of being in one camp and sometimes trying to overcome barriers within the other and vice versa. And that's something I'm very aware of myself. And just before I talk about um, As I Am's uh, work <clears throat> with the LGBTQ um, advocacy space, I might just give some context as my own experiences. So I am a cis, obviously a um, queer person um, and I like I would um, usually I would like to I would prefer to identify as queer myself and for my own experiences growing up as you can tell from my accent I didn't grow up on this side of the border and the concept of intersectionality is something that's not you don't really hear a lot about uh, in Northern Ireland and the zeitgeist of the time of whenever I was growing up like I'm a child I was born in 1994 I'm a Good Friday Agreement a child but still the discourse around that would be very much around nationality and what side of the divide you're on, issues like your sexuality, your ethnicity, and um, indeed your, uh, even new politics were missed out. Uh, issues like that were very much regarded as a private affair you deal with in your own space and even within your own community that there naturally would have been prejudices, uh, even very a lot of unconscious biases. So with regards to my own you know, out, um, I by no means grew up in a bigoted family, but all the same, you know, going through a very Catholic upbringing, you naturally acqu acquire a lot of biases and views on that. And so for a long time, it was a very private thing. And the issue of reaching out to someone for help, uh, or not even help even, but just socializing and meeting other people who were like you, uh it wasn't really something that was talked about or looked at and then whenever you add autism into the mix i was diagnosed slightly later i was diagnosed around age 10. i have a younger brother who's on the spectrum but he had his autism would be a bit more profound and he also has an intellectual disability so his challenges are very visible and they're very um 
they I wouldn't say would certainly wouldn't say addressable. They're very complex, but I suppose they consumed a lot of uh, my parents' time growing up, whereas mine perhaps weren't as overt and maybe a bit more nuanced. And it was only then in my teens and early twenties that I really appreciate the intersectionality between the two. So with regards to just um, the intersectionality between the autistic sphere and the LGBTQ, I mean, it's well documented that neurodivergent people, even as a whole, are more likely to identify as queer uh, than their neurotypical counterparts. Why, we don't know, but it's just, it's, uh, that's what the research is indicating. It's in its infancy, but it's strong suggestions point to that. However, there's a lot of barriers that you would say, like both camps uh, face in their own right. Um, particularly around, you know, isolation, difficulty socialising, maintaining relationships, discussing their sexuality and meeting like-minded people and developing healthier habits around relationships, honing them down and doing things outside of the usual venues, which in the LGBT um, space are very much structured around extroverted events around partying, there's a lot of alcohol, loud noise and different substances going around and that's not the most friendly environment for autistic people. It is for some, but not for most people I know uh, personally. So with regards to just how I was hoping that as I am could address that, I mean we do get communication, we get correspondence from young queer people who are on the spectrum who are very mindful of that, who know their sexuality, who want to make friends and indeed want to form relationships but they struggle to do that because they encounter what they feel, and indeed I felt myself, are buyers uh, unspoken within the LGBT space, in that, just going back to earlier, high social events, in that extroverted personalities are very much the dominant force there, and introverted, who maybe aren't minded to drink, who maybe prefer quieter spaces, they're not really thought of by organizers, and there is, thankfully, shout outs, and Dublin Pride have indicated, they want to make more accessible and more inclusive venues with regards to that. But on the whole, beyond that, I mean, just the fact that in Dublin um, there is a growing need, but I think back to my own hometown of Belfast, um, very little springs to mind. I mean, most events pre COVID were around bars and drinking, and that's grand. Like, you know, I myself, I love a good pop, I love uh, hitting the George with Gremlin on Friday or weekend, I do love drag. Uh, but all the same, there are times, you know, where going like, somewhere like a book club would be lovely or you know in our class uh, and that just unfortunately isn't available and then going into issues like around exploring your sexuality and understanding it and um, especially for folks who identify as non-binary or trans that can be especially difficult and there's a whole politics as to accessing appropriate health care which I won't, I won't get into because I know we could spend hours talking about that but fundamentally it's about raising awareness and acknowledging between the two camps and indeed others that there's a lot more that unites us there and there's a need for us to even understand each other because it isn't an easy process. Intersectionality truly is understanding each other. Um, which, you know, I would love someone from my part of the world's last person who could talk about that, but I suppose it just speaks to the struggle. I think that some people, perhaps, whenever they talk about inclusivity and intersectionality, it's sometimes missed that there are challenges for both sides to understand each other and there may be ignorant comments made stupid questions asked and fundamentally that's a part of the whole process and learning so our work with shout out just going to what as am has been doing just all rising from that and um, we ourselves want to just raise awareness there and that although there are people in as i am who would identify as queer in various capacities um on that spectrum as it is autistic we would like to make sure that we're informed as we go forward and that we don't say or advocate for anything that wouldn't be appropriate or wouldn't be consultative in that respect. So work with Shout Out was brilliant in that they did a fabulous workshop with us in December time. Our whole team did it, all 14 of us, and it was really, really informative. I learned stuff um, and I thought I was fairly clued in to the dynamics of the community, um, but there you go. And going forward, it is a personal aspiration of mine to work on a policy paper that sets out recommendations and definitive research in an Irish context, which is so lacking, unfortunately, across loads of spheres, um, on the experiences of LGBT young people in Ireland who are on the spectrum. And indeed, that covers not just, um, you know, uh, I'm just conscious that the, pro the profile of that is very often white and very settled and uh, there's a much bigger cohort um, there and that's important to uh, 
understand the aspects as well as you come from the traffic community, which has its own perspective, of course, on LGBTQ, from those from other ethnic minorities, the New Irish, whose parents have recently settled to Ireland, and they, you know, have grown up from, with both cultural perspectives. So going forward, like I just absolutely am delighted to be here. And I think it's fantastic that we're in this kind of space because it's only in recent years that we've seen these spaces come about and more and more just need to be done. And that I absolutely take what Leif was saying about the likes of the Together for Yes campaigns and the Yes Equality in that it was great to see that, but it was very much the same people on either side um advocating for it and that there needs to be a greater acknowledgement and greater visibility from people who you know would be very clued into those um and going forward yeah i'd be delighted for us personally and as an organization to be part of that so it's great to be here thank you so much gavin and um, there was so much there as well and one thing that i think i'm particularly interested in is that whole idea of is it any surprise that our community on the one hand um touches so other so many other communities within society when as a starting point many of us either don't accept or, or understand or align with prevailing norms to begin with and um, if, if there is even such a thing and um, on the other hand one of the things that i was thinking a lot about as, as i was listening to all the presentations is that we have so much work to do on this within the autism community but i think one of the own starting points is actually when we think about what we need to move away from, I think, is first of all, this kind of hierarch hierarchy and needs that we sometimes all like to play to, where we either want to be more oppressed or oppressed or less oppressed than the person sitting next to us. So, you know, within the autism community, we know about how people sometimes love to put an emphasis on, well, you know, my child is now very, very high functioning, very independent. They would, they would, their needs wouldn't be like that. Or indeed, and I think we even saw this sometimes, you know, when, when our community faces particular challenges like it did at the start of the year with the closure of schools and there was the whole piece of, well, you know, this cohort of children deserves it, but this cohort of children doesn't. And, you know, there's, there's enough people uh, that we have to deal with and, and educate in the world without us starting to fight with each other. So I think even just when we, we think of just autism as a standalone community, we need to do a lot more to be accepting of everybody within that community. And then the logical part of that is reaching out and recognizing that people are not two-dimensional and that, that people are going to be parts of all other groups and oppressed groups within society and um, I just have a couple of questions things that struck me from people's talks that I'd love to throw out and let everybody respond to if that's if that's okay and um, one question I wanted to ask because I, I was just again when I was listening none of the communities represented here today I think are communities that don't experience oppression I think that's fair to say and um, at the same time, what I think is just interesting is that when I think about autism and the work that we do, I mean, judgment and attitude is the key barrier that we're told about again and again in all the surveys and consultations that we do, that perhaps it's the biggest barrier to people being accepted and, and thriving within the community. And um, I guess what I'm kind of curious to know is what are the learnings from other communities about how we can address stigma? Just one example, um, within irishjobs.ie, as I am survey at the start of this month, 75% of autistic people wouldn't share uh, their diagnosis with an employer. I know in another piece of work uh, that we did in DCU, at the time, 54% of students who we spoke with who are autistic wouldn't um, disclose to anyone in university or hadn't that they were autistic. A citing very interestingly kind of the fear of being treated differently or negative past experiences of disclosure. So I guess this is a collective issue. It's an example of collective action, I guess. How do we end stigma? And um, I know what the sort of things we've been trying to do within the autism community around, you know, promoting acceptance as opposed to awareness, talking about autism in a positive way, promoting autistic voice. But is there learning from other communities that, that are relevant to the autism community as well? We all want to jump into that question. <laughs> um, if ever, if people are okay, I might, I might take that on. Um, I suppose in terms of travelers, like we have been trying for decades, trying to change the narrative around the negative, um, I suppose stereotypes about us within society. You know that we're born into, or that we choose the way that we live. Uh, we don't want to be educated, and our culture is based on crime. That we're all criminals. Uh, which is so far from, from the truth. Um, but I think it's about, 
you know, portraying uh, the positivity within the community, you know, um, and po using positive language. I think it's all about positive language. I'm just thinking like in terms of your community, and I know I'm a parent um, and, and critiquing, but um, I think it can be, you know, some of the language used can be very negative, you know, in terms of disorder um, and going from a medical model when really it might be more beneficial. Like I'm just thinking of other disability movements um, or even the traveler movement that is from a human right um, perspective that you're working towards um, and that it's all bringing back to the connection that everybody has human rights and it's, it's around like your identity like you're being discriminated and excluded because you're autistic and um, like your stats are not necessarily because you were born autistic our statistics are not because I was born traveller, it's because society is inflicting discrimination and oppression on us. Um, so I think it's the more positive language and more positive images that we can get out um, of travellers or autistic community, the different diversity within the autistic community uh, and the traveller community again. Um, but and inviting people into spaces to try to see, to get a feel, a lived experience for what it's like to be a traveller or what it's like to be autistic. Um, in terms of being autistic, you'll never get 100% lived experience unless you're autistic. But I know like even coming into a family who has an autistic member and learning from them what their, what their life is like, um, you know, to get a bit of an insight so you can empathize. Because I know from my own experience, like a lot of people hold on to those stereotypes of what my son can't do or you know, will never be able to do when in fact he is a child with his whole life ahead of him and every ch child will reach their milestones uh, at a different time. Um, and you, you can't compare any child, whether it's neurotypical or an autistic child. Um, so I think it's re really breaking down the negative language. Um, I know I've said that a few times because I just think it's so important because I know that's what, as a parent, when I first uh, when my son was first diagnosed, the language was just so, for me, so frightening and um, and really gave me great concern because it was all about it's a disorder and lack of communication skills, lack of independence. Um, and I just thought I even tried to frame it, you know, that I'm working, I'm working with my child to be his boy so he'll have his human rights like any other child. Um, yes, he's autistic, but it's not the fact that he's autistic that is given him um, problems are leading to his oppression is the fact that society is oppressing him because he's autistic, because it's not catering for his needs, if that makes sense. Definitely. That's that's really interesting. Um, so, um, I've also thought of a response. And basically, I think none of the communities that I'm part of anyway, so neurodivergent and um, queer, have gotten quite far enough that we can say that we ended stigma. But I think if we look to the other extreme of people trying to enforce stigma who've been successful, what they've done is they've dehumanized language. So thinking to um, the worst example I can think of, back to Nazi Germany and Holocaust, if we look at the propaganda that was spread at the time, it was very successful at dehumanizing Jewish people primarily, but also disabled people and um, ethnic minorities and the way they did that was primarily by denying the humanity of humans. They almost never use the word person or people in any of their propaganda. They used the Jew or rats or um, exterminate the, um, there, there's like a type of, a type of bug I forget what it was, but um, primarily they just went to any extreme to avoid acknowledging that the crimes they were committing were crimes against other humans. So I think what we can learn from that is that really deep down in us, if we view a person as a person and as being as complex as us and having, you know, the the same um, ability to feel as us because that's a whole thing about empathy that gets tied up in autism a lot then that can be very powerful and likewise 
even if we go to less extreme examples, if we read neurotribes and uh, the history of autism, of examples of words like eliminate autism and mm. that sort of thing. So I think the main power behind humanizing would be from from making people realize that it's not an abstract it's an actual set of people that you know have lives have families have hopes have dreams have struggles have all the things and i'd say the best way to humanize people is to simply say autistic people or the autistic person or just always bring either a name to the story or just bring back that um, acknowledgement that we all share the same the same earth if nothing else and we all share our humanity if nothing else thanks Leighton. did you want to come in on that gavin what the other speakers have said covers quite a lot there um in, ter in terms of challenging stigma i mean this answer kind of it's a bit tangential but i hope it answers the question and that it goes into how we can challenge that stigma through better activism and by that i think just becoming increasingly more visible mm. and active and more political in that kind of activism and engaging with uh political parties and urging them uh be they big or small to advocate disability issues and we've seen really good examples of that in the uk uh with Labour, who produced a whole neurodiversity manifesto, and Ply Cymru in Wales, who I believe have a whole section of their manifesto dedicated to autism and neurodiversity. So that comes about from those two parties that I just mentioned, having quite visible and quite active uh, disability wings, which were able to put their issues to the forefront. And just from talking to people I know in either of those parties, they drew a lot of inspiration from other communities like the women's movement, like the LGBT movement. And it was very much a case of, well, if you know they're able to organize effectively, why can't we? And indeed, why, you know, there's so much we could learn from those uh, two cohorts. Um, and there we go, we've seen proof of pudding that that works. Now that's not without the challenges, of course, in that it goes into, problems of well, how do you prior well, which groups do you prioritize during electoral cycles and especially and we know ourselves and that's I am whenever programs for government need to be organized um, it's a very fine balance of interest there and indeed tackling stigma is a major major um, policy goal for parties to engage in that once they're elected and a key lesson I suppose to the disability movement to feed into those discussions and suggest policies that those parties could implement would again be drawing inspiration from other parties and very much what Leighton said around acknowledging a shared humanity because again at the very end of the day we are all human and indeed neurodivergency knows no border it knows no creed or socioeconomic status and by that I mean of course um, you know anyone can be affected by it so fundamentally it's about acknowledging that and understanding how we can create more accessible pathways and create an even playing field for everybody in society and that will be a very long and drawn out challenge and addressing stigma always is and uh, building more accessible and understanding societies always is but i think fundamentally it comes back to being a bit more proactive and maybe engaging in a more political capital e sense maybe so my thoughts on it that's brilliant and now I'm going to move you into a rapid fire. Um, I only want a couple of sentences from everybody on this, but uh, what, I, what I want to ask kind of to close out is one thing that our community could do in adapting our outreach to become more accessible to other minority groups. Um, and the other piece, I suppose, is when we talk about autism friendly, we often talk about it, I suppose, in a very general societal sense. What's one thing um, other minorities could do to make our community feel more welcome and accepting. So it's that bridge piece that we talk about all of the time. How can we meet each other halfway? Um, who'd like to go first? So I think for outreach to other groups, I think the main thing that you can do is lead by example and be very clear that, say, if you're hiring in As I Am, and you're hoping to get someone of an ethnic minority or 
um, who's who's black that you actually put that in as not a requirement but maybe a, a recommended or you know the way in in job postings they say the things that are absolutely required and then they say things which are an advantage or beneficial you could include that in the beneficial because that would really mean it would be a practical way of reaching out and it would also be quite a challenge for someone who is an ethnic minority to be the first person in an organization who is not white or not settled. So I think you really have to be quite, not blatant, but quite firm in in your messaging about it. And then the other one, um, I haven't really thought of what other communities can do, but I suppose I'd say probably diversifying a bit how they, um, how they organize and how they hold events. So what I mean by this is, say you are a black person who has autism, and you want to be involved in the Black Lives Matter movement. There are some social media things you can do and there are ways into it, but a lot of the events and things that are kind of associated with that movement are associated with big crowds and um, with like the, the megaphones and that sort of thing. So I think just kind of them diversifying mm -hmm. the environment and um that would be the main thing there and then for you it would be communication around it um so yeah that's, that's right thank you yeah. thanks a minute rosemary did you want to come in i think yeah <laughs> Um, and I've actually got a load of uh, thinking time there. Um, yeah, and I totally just agree with everything you said there, in particular around representation in the staff team, the board team, um, because reputation, rep, representation matters. Um, and in particular, uh, you know, for the travel artistic children that are growing up now, they, need, they have found, I suppose, autistic role models, but they're settled. Mm -hmm. You know, and wouldn't it be great if they saw a traveler who's autistic be more to the forefront of the work of as I am in whatever capacity that was um, you know and you know you could do that again in your recruitment just in terms of you know letting it I don't know if you already do this but just letting them people know that you're an equal opportunities employer and you know and that everybody is equal and in particular you could like name some communities um, within that um, and I think it's around outreach as well it's very important that when we are free from COVID-19 you know, that you once a quarter, you know, that some of your team could be actively going out into uh, like travel organizations um, or other ethnic minority organizations right into the heart of the community so that they are seeing that, yes, we are welcome within the autistic community, but also they get the expertise from you as autistic people that they can bring that into their daily lives for their autistic family members, which is very important because it is the other family members that need to change and not the autistic member that needs to change. Um, and I suppose in terms of ethnic, ethnic minorities becoming more autistic friendly is just that, that we do need to reach out to you, invite you into our spaces to educate us, um, you know, to guide us in how to hold autistic friendly events um, or even around changing the work environment. Um, because like I have, in all the organizations that I have worked in, um, trying to make it autistic friendly was never an issue. Um, and maybe we had autistic travelers working alongside us all along um, and they were afraid to identify and God knows what, um, how hard it was for them to be within that environment. And they didn't feel confident enough to speak up. And um, because I know in the ethos that we work from around equality and inclusion, that travel organizations would be the first to try to make those adjustments mm -hmm. so that autistic travelers or autistic settled people could be comfortable within 
our environment and I'm even looking back now at conferences and events you know that would have been happening in the in the movement and I don't think they were autistic friendly you know to be honest and it's only now that I know what being autistic means through my son and from learning from autistic people that now I realize that you know and that's just the proof in the pudding by coming together and learning from each other both communities all communities benefit from intersectionality absolutely Gavin the final word to you if you'd like it um actually I think with regards to uh, just in more like, reaching out to more people I think the last the two panelists uh hit the nail on the head and just being more proactive I really like that idea post-COVID of really just being at the heart of other communities and proactively contacting them and asking for more meetings like this to hear one another's views and challenges and experiences and I definitely think from like a policy perspective and as I am that's been absolutely essential as well just you know using the shout out example and going forward it would just just really, you don't even need to think about it. it is the logical thing to do uh, to get that shared experience from a perspective that's not yours or that you want to get more information from and um, if we were to do a project together with somewhere like Pavi Point for example it would only be natural that we reach out to them and we'd actively collaborate together on that shared vision so I suppose absolutely just for the obstacle to us was this. thank you thank you so much and I want to say a huge thank you to everyone for giving up your time um, and for helping us put today together and um, it's great to have had this conversation which I see as a as a as a next step on the road and a, and a starting point um, as opposed to an end in and of itself and um, we hope people have enjoyed listening let us know in our comments on social media and uh, what you thought what your experiences of intersectionality are and where you think we should go to from here so thank you every, everybody for being part of it thanks for tuning in and we hope to see you at one of our webinars again soon thank you Thank you. Thanks.